Balancing your portfolio is critical to investment success. Today, I'm showing you how I would spend $25,000 on a balanced basketball card portfolio. Let's day to die. Welcome back to another episode of Data Dive. My name is Tyler Nethercott, better known as Teapot. This episode is brought to you by Market Movers. Market Movers has the largest database of verified cards, now tracking almost 540,000 cards across 20 sports, as well as Marvel. Visit marketmoversapp.com to start your free trial today. All right, today I wanna to talk about an extremely important topic when it comes to any form of investing, and that is having a balanced portfolio. Speculating can be a lot of fun on up and comers, but it can also be a bit of a wild ride. You win some and you lose some. Nobody hits on every rookie speculation play. The risk is when you hit on below 50%, the financial effects can be really, really brutal. Now, some people get the impression that if they're investing in many different players, that they're not putting all their eggs in one basket, but that's not necessarily true. You need to pay attention to the different types of funds should go without saying that long-term risk of blue chip players like Jordan or Kobe surely differs from speculative plays on guys like Lamella Ball or Cade Cunningham. Now there are sound ways to invest in all of these players and to make a profit and mitigate risk. And in order to illustrate this, I'm going to show you what I might've done hypothetically over the last 90 days to invest $25,000 into basketball cards. So let's get into that data. So what I've done here is I've basically pulled up my collection. I created a category in my collection called Balanced Portfolio, and I'm gonna walk you through the different players that I've invested in and the rationale behind some of the cards. So I have to say this again, and as always, this video is meant for educational purposes only. I do not actually own any of the cards in this video, although a few of them are on my long-term want list. Now there are many ways you can invest in cards, many eras, and many sports. I chose basketball, but you can do this with any sport or with multiple sports. So again, let's walk through this breakdown a little bit. So what I've done here is I've gone to the player tab. And the nice thing about this player tab is that it allows you to see your portfolio breakdown by the different players in that category or in your overall portfolio. So again, I've filtered onto this category. And if I click on this, you can see the key players are all gonna be highlighted. You can either hover, it over, hover over them and get that view here, or you can hover over each of these pie slices. Now, in general, I recommend diversifying your portfolio in the following way. Roughly 50 to 60% should go into blue chip players. This is comparable to large cap stocks. These are the cards that you should seek to buy during dips and then plan to hold them for the long term. 20 to 30% should go into mid cap type players. These are guys who are still playing and who have things left to prove, but who have also risen to the top of the league and who project to have strong legacies when it's all said and done. These are players that you can plan to flip in season, or you may hold their cards for a few months or a few, a few years even. You may even want to just hold them for the long term. So these are kind of fitting in that gray area, right in the in-between. And then finally, I would say about 10 to 30% of your investment should be into speculation. These are small cap type players. This is all about your risk tolerance as well as your goals. Now there are the, these guys that you're gonna be seeking to buy before they blow up. These are the ultimate boomer bust. And these are the guys that you actually want to avoid if they come out overhyped. And we talk a lot about that in other videos. I'm not gonna get into that too much, but obviously timing is really important on both our sports card investor channel as well as in the videos. On this channel, we talk all about how timing matters and how players that are at the top of the league come out potentially way too hot and could be a huge risk to lose money. So let's jump back over here and look at what I did here in terms of this investment mix. So right away, 25% into Michael Jordan. If you're thinking blue chip with basketball, obviously there's no one better than MJ. Moving over 17% into Kobe Bryant, 12% into Shaquille O'Neal. So if I add that up, I've got 25%, 42%, 54%, and then I'm gonna jump down here to Steph Curry at a little bit under 5%. I would kind of consider Steph in that class. He's still playing, but he's already got a legacy. If he retired today, we know he's a Hall of Famer. He's one of the greatest of all time. So no question that his cards are gonna hold value for the long term. So totaling that all up, that's right around 60%. I've actually got a Durant card in here too. I'd put him into that category. 
So that's gonna put it right around 60%. Now, if I move back over here, I've got Luca at 11.65%, roughly 12%, Trey Young at 8%, Giannis at 6%, Joel Embiid at 5% and then Shea Gilgis Alexander at 2%. The rest of the others total up to 7%. So there's an interesting thing here, right? Giannis is kind of, he's, I guess he's in that mid cap category. He's kind of a fringe player. He's really already obviously established himself, multiple MVPs, defensive player of the year, you know, NBA champion, finals MVP. So he's kind of right there, but I think he sort of toes the line between blue chip and that mid cap. So what I wanna do is actually just kind of walk you through the rest of the players. So there's 30 total cards that I've invested in here, just under $25,000 paid. And what I did was the assumption was that this was over the last 90 days. So really sometime between December and January is when I would have bought these cards. And you can see, you know, not a ton of appreciation, up 6% in that time frame. My goal honestly was not to go in and just find all the cards that have gone up in the most in that, you know, time frame, but rather to actually spend some time thinking about the types of players over the last 90 days that I might have been targeting and the specific cards and why. So let's scroll down and take a look. So Anthony Edwards here, I picked one Anthony Edwards cards. I'm pretty high on Anthony Edwards in general. And one thing you'll see is that I do tend to target uh, cards with good eye appeal. That could be a great design or that could be something like a color match. Another thing I like to do is to go after cards that are you know, somewhat more rare, some cards that are gonna carry scarcity over time. So if you look at this one, this is actually his blue optic to 59, serial number to 59. It's an awesome card. This one was going for uh, $800. Uh, let's see, when did I buy this one? I said back in the beginning of December. And this one, unfortunately, is one of the ones that I put into the portfolio that's come down the most. So again, there's some uh, intellectual integrity and honesty here, but this is a card that I would still be pretty bullish on for the long term. Obviously, since it's raw, it's a great candidate to get it graded, assuming that you know the condition of the copy you bought is worth it. This would be a card that I would send to PSA. So that's the, the card that I chose for Anthony Edwards. That's gonna fall definitely into the speculation category, into that you know 10 to 30%, depending on what your risk appetite is. Moving down, Cam Reddish. <clears throat> One card here for Cam Reddish. And honestly, the thought was, there were rumors that he was going to be traded back in December, early into January, and obviously that did come to fruition. I look at these cards, you know, this one, this is the fast break purple number to 75, uh, bought it, you know, for $66 back in December, and this card actually would have gone up to $160. So this would have been a really smart play. We always talk about trade rumors and what that can do for a player. You know, Reddish moving up to New York remains to be seen what's gonna happen with him, but that's what I would, you know, look at in terms of another uh, speculative play. Darius Garland, another speculative, speculative play. One Darius Garland card, and it's the Sunburst Revolution card, raw to 75. I had a little bit of play money left as I was getting to the end of my budget. So I looked and said, okay, this one could have been bought for about 80 bucks, up just $5 uh, since then. Nothing to write home about, but Darius Garland, again, I'm looking for kind of unique cards, cards with some rarity, cards with eye appeal. DeAndre Hunter, this is a guy who, you know, he showed some flashes last year before he got injured that he could turn around his offensive game and be a, a very efficient offensive scorer. He's definitely a good defender. He's good in space. He's good on the ball. Uh, Darius Hunter is a guy that I'm, you know, still pretty bullish on long term. And this is his choice red prism to 88. Uh, you know, visually, these are really stunning cards. Um, I would have bought this one for $51 and pretty much stayed flat since then. So Giannis, let's take a look at Giannis. Again, rarity, you can go for rookie cards, certainly go for rookie cards, and sometimes it makes sense to go for the iconic rookie card, or you can go for one like this Court Kings rookie card. I'm personally pretty high on Court Kings cards. I think they're awesome looking. And that's the kind of set to me that could, could catch on long-term, could be more popular as visual trends, as design trends change. It's one that's not you know, necessarily viewed as the most popular today by a lot of people. But if we go back to the 90s and we look at a, a set like Fleer Metal, like Skybox Metal, that wasn't that popular then, and it's blown up since then. So I think about Court Kings as one of those revolutions, another one like that, that could catch on over time and become potentially more popular. And then a huge card here, you know, in my opinion, these uh, one and one downtown cards, these are highly sought after, as well as the Court Kings blank slate cards. And these cards actually uh, have a really high gem rate. They grade very well. So this is a raw copy again, this is one that I would have considered sending off for grading. 
Embiid, one Embiid card uh, being kind of high in him. People were kind of sleeping on the Sixers. I think they still are in some ways, maybe not now that they have Harden. But I was looking at Embiid and thinking, you know, this is a team that's right there in the East, probably a top three team in the East. This was before the trade. You didn't have Simmons playing and they were still competing very well. Embiid was, you know, obviously playing really well. But this was kind of when the hype around Curry that started with the season was starting to dwindle. You could have bought this card for $700 at the beginning of January, and it has since doubled in price, most recently selling for $1,450. I've got a KD card in here, Topps Chrome flagship rookie. Honestly, probably can't go wrong with that card. Would have been down since I last bought it. Now, Kobe. I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail here with Kobe. So I'll pull this up and show you these three cards, but let me jump over to Kobe's chart and show you and kind of explain why I would have bought these three specific cards. So again, I like low population. Personally, not a big fan of the, the basic tops rookie card of Kobe. I just think there's too many copies. They'll probably always hold a really important place, but Kobe also has a lot of really awesome other rookie cards, including this Flare Showcase Row Zero. It's a PSA 8 Pop 260. I think there's around 400 to 450 graded higher as nines or tens with PSA. Flare is a set that is truly iconic. Honestly, it was revolutionary in many ways back in the 90s. And again, just take a look at this absolutely visually stunning card. Uh, really, really beautiful. So that's why I chose this particular Kobe Bryant card. Precious Metal. This was, the, this was the first year of Precious Metal. This was not Precious Metal Gems. These were the ones without that sort of burnt metal background. Kind of tough to decipher if you're not familiar with them. Normally, I wouldn't say buy a PSA 7 of a card from the 90s, but this is one that's pop 8, and I think it's under 100, maybe around 80 in population higher as 8, 9s, or 10s with PSA. These were really short printed. You basically got one in every 36 packs back then, and you had this huge checklist. So the odds of pulling a specific player were extremely, extremely rare. And then finally, the 1997 Topps Chrome Refractor here for Kobe Bryant. Now, if you were to compare this card, which is, again, this is Pop 8, uh, sorry, Pop 44. Uh, we can double check actually and see how many are higher. If we open this up, we can go right out to PSA's site, scroll down and see 115 higher. So you're talking about 160 cards or so uh, in this copy, you know, graded from his sophomore season. Still early Topps Chrome. These refractor sets are highly sought after. And compare the price of this PSA 8, which uh, let's, let's actually see what, what was this one going for. We would have bought this for $1,400 to a PSA 8 rookie Topps Chrome refractor, which is multiples, multiples, multiples higher than that card. Uh, that's why I like this one. You know, we're working with a budget, still a really iconic card, obviously with him throwing down the dunk and um, very low in population. So that's why I kind of took, took a stab on these Kobe's. Let's keep scrolling down. Handful of players left. I picked two Luka cards, both from Prism. Uh, you know, I think there's something special about that 2018 Prism set. People seem to really like it. It's a great photo of him, you know, kind of his signature fadeaway. And I took the Pink Ice. This is actually a card that I had once upon a time. I had a PSA 10 of this that I had purchased at one point for like 1600 and was able to sell for around 3200 It's come down quite a bit since then. A lot of Luca cards, a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, Prism cards from 2018 have come down since then. But I would have looked at this and said, wow, $1,500, $1,600. People seem to have lost track of Luca this season. I still really believe in him long term. I think he's one of the best players in the league and will be for a long time. So this one would have appreciated nicely up for $125. Same thing with the Purple Wave, very low population uh, on the Purple Wave cards. $764 is what we would have paid back in December, up $336 since then. And Luca would be a guy that I would be holding, you know, not just for this season, but for several seasons to come because I think he's got a lot of uh, potential. Now, this is kind of a flyer, low dollar card here, but this was, you know, I was thinking about Embiid. And I thought the same thing with Matisse, Matisse Thibel is that depending on how that roster shakes out, if the Sixers get into the playoffs, if they end up with any injuries, which they seem to have battled off and on, uh, Thibel's a guy who's a great defender. He could make a big defensive play in a game. Uh, he's not a bad shooter. He's not a, obviously not a volume scorer, but if he makes a big play as part of Philadelphia making a run, then this card could go up quite a bit. PSA 10 hollow for $29 honestly felt like a no brainer. The floor on that card seems uh, much closer to that price than the ceiling would be if Thibel does something big in the playoffs. 
All right, now we get to Jordan and similar to the Kobe, I'm actually gonna show you and the chart specifically for the Jordan and kind of walk you through this. So this is the last 90 days and right away we've got the iconic insert, really the insert that kind of got it all started in many people's eyes, the scoring kings from Fleer Ultra. You really just can't go wrong with this card. PSA 9, uh, pop 239, very low uh, you know, pop overall between the 9s and the 10s. This set is one of my favorite sets that wasn't super rare, but has definitely caught on in the last 12 to 18 months. People really love it. You got this sort of like portal background, almost like he's, you know, Thanos coming out and uh, Endgame coming, you know, jumping across space. And then both of the gold medallion PSA 10s. PSA 10 gold medallions, very low population regardless of the player. Uh, this is a set that's prone to chipping, really tough grade. And uh, so we can take a look. I think I do, you know, like these 1997 ones a little bit better. It's almost like a gold sparkle type finish on the card. And the 1998, you know, him, it's a horizontal landscape card, not necessarily quite as desirable, but it does have that awesome gold finish. This picture doesn't actually really do this card justice. So I didn't go for any of Jordan's, obviously his rookie cards. I could have looked at like a PSA one Fleer rookie card. That's not something that I'm really crazy about investing in at that low of a grade. And even, you know, the, the subsequent years like 87, 88, PSA 10s, those sell pretty high. The PSA 9s were around $1,800, I think, for an 87. I'd rather go for these iconic inserts. Maybe that's hearkening back to something, you know, nostalgic for me. I have more attachment to these cards, but I think these are better bets overall long term. All right, let's jump back. So I've got RJ Barrett, one card for RJ here, a nice color match prism. I just think, uh, you know, the Knicks are still floundering. I didn't really believe in them going into this year, but Barrett's a guy that I think could continue to develop. He's still very young and can't go wrong with the color match. Shea Gilgis Alexander. Okay, so let's take a look at this Shea Gilgis Alexander. His courtside silver, very low population. Uh, this is a guy who's right now in Oklahoma City. Maybe he stays there. Maybe they rebuild around him. Maybe he ends up getting traded. Who knows what they're doing with all those draft picks. But he's a guy who can really, really play and kind of a fan favorite from that 2018 class after Luca and Trey. This uh, fast break, kind of a color match here, uh, fast break red, and this is a, you know, obviously again, same logic with the Luca cards. And then this one in particular, this was kind of a lower dollar buy at $62, the uh, SGC 10 Prism Mosaic Red. And I wanna jump you over to this chart that'll show you kind of a comparison. And these are the types of opportunities that you can look for, especially when you're using a tool like Market Movers, is I pulled up the SGC 10 blue, the SGC 10 red. These cards are similar in rarity. Sim they were very similar in rarity. They're not numbered. And then I pulled up the PSA 10 blue and the PSA 10 red. And you can see that the red mosaic in an SGC 10 is for some reason floating down here, whereas the blue had sold for much higher and the PSA 10s are obviously much higher. So you've got the PSA 10 up here at $149 two and a half times what we paid for the SGC 10. So whether it's a crossover candidate or just something where there's an arbitrage opportunity between the grades, I just thought that was definitely a smart buy. Okay, scrolling down, I'm gonna skip Shaq and come back to him because we'll close out with his charts. So I got this Steph awesome color match. I was looking at Steph's rookie cards and thinking what might I buy, but then 2013, it's probably tied for me with 2018 and my favorite two prism years. Uh, and I love these blue retail ones, obviously with the color match, stunning card, uh, $1,300, hasn't sold since then. So that's one that I would love to have of Steph. For Trey, I went with a couple of select cards from 2018. I went with this nice light blue, which is numbered, I believe, to 175, as well as the super short printed Zebra in the court side for $1,800. I think those court sides, again, like the Shea, and the zebras both very very popular and in high demand and then tyrese halliburton now again obviously hindsight is 2020 but even back a few months ago we knew something was going to have to change with the kings halliburton honestly was the guy that i was hoping the pistons would take when they took killian hayes but halliburton's obviously a really solid player he ended up getting traded and now he's getting even more minutes he's kind of the lead guard combo guard type guy very smart with the ball very efficient scorer and I love these premium box set cards out of Optic in a PSA 10. These are numbered to 249. So they're pretty short printed in general. And then when you try to get 10s, uh, obviously that comes into play too. So this card would have been $92 up to 138.50 since he's been traded and been playing well. 
Let's close this out with the shack cards and I'll kind of talk you through this. So I went with three shack cards. This is firmly in that blue chip category. So firstly, Shaq to me doesn't have a lot of super compelling rookie cards, but the gold uh, tops, these are kind of the, you know, an early parallel. Low population, pop 571 on the PSA 10s, uh, you know, kind of hard to go wrong in that case. This is one of my favorite, absolute favorite insert sets from the 90s, the Noise Boys from Skybox Thunder. I recently picked up a PSA 9 Grant Hill of this for my personal collection. PSA 8, pop 6, you know, the population, again, if we click out to the PSA site is going to be, you know, really low, uh, 28 higher. So this is a set that was very rare. And then similarly, the kabooms, obviously, let's close it out with a kaboom. That iconic picture of Shaq throwing it down with his legs spread. We know he used to do that a lot when he was with Los Angeles. PSA 9, pop 15, and we would have paid, you know, $700 or so for that card. So that's the portfolio in essence. Now, one other thing that you can do that's really cool is if you come over here, you can go to my price movements specific for my collection. And I've filtered on balance portfolio and you can filter and see how your cards have been doing over time. So I went through this last 90 days and you can just kind of scroll through and get a picture for what your cards have been doing. This is really helpful when you're trying to decide when maybe to move something. If you're looking at cards sort of almost irrespective of the price that you paid for the card, you can look at what they've been doing recently and decide, you know what, now might be the right time to move it if the card's up 100%, whether you're in the hole or not, sometimes it still makes sense to move things. So again, this is a really helpful view to scroll down and see all the cards in your collection, filter by different categories, and be able to track and trace you know, how they're performing over time. So. That's an example of how I would spend $25,000 if I were building a diversified portfolio. Now, the best part of it about this is that you still get a lot of room to pick the players that you like. Building a strong personal collection is something I believe is important to being successful in the hobby. If you connect with the cards and they resonate with you, you're going to have a lot more fun along the way. So what do you think of this approach? Uh, how much of your investment money do you allocate into each of that, those categories, the blue chip, the mid cap, and the speculative plays? I'd love to hear more about it from you down in the comments. Thanks again for stopping by today. And if you're not already a subscriber, be sure to give Market Movers a try with our new free seven-day trial. Thanks for watching. And until next time, happy investing.